Hello, welcome to this second Bible study on the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. I'm your host, Mark Yerkes. Personal testimonies are a most effective means of spreading the gospel, yet many Christians give little thought to their salvation experience. Perhaps we think our testimony is too ordinary. Maybe we don't have any miraculous events associated with it, or uh, we think our testimony is boring. Allow me to argue that no salvation experience is ordinary. There is nothing boring about a life that is saved by God's grace. But at least we can understand why people would make this wrong assumption. There's something exciting about a life that has gone from the depths of depravity to the spiritual mountaintop. We are enthralled by stories of drug addicts and thieves whose lives were turned upside down when they met Christ, or a person who was ready to commit suicide when God suddenly intervened, or a person who was dying from a fatal disease trusted God and was completely healed spiritually and physically. Now imagine the conversion of the most notorious sinner you know. If that person repented, wouldn't that reveal how great the love and grace of God is? That is the kind of conversion Saul of Tarsus had. We already know from Lesson 1 that Saul was a religious zealot of the worst kind, arrogant, self-righteous, hateful, and deadly. Paul's testimony about himself spells it out clearly. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Acts 26, 9 through 11. Saul was a persecutor, but the depths of his rage were demonstrated in his forcing of weak Christians to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. Take note of Paul's description of his attitude toward the believers in Christ. He said he was exceedingly mad against them. I don't believe the English translation does justice to Saul's reaction. Exceedingly mad sounds too gentle, too sophisticated. A fuller translation might be something like this, insanely out of control, ruled by violent hatred towards them. Saul was crazy with rage. Now let's talk about the events that took place on the road to Damascus. In the ninth chapter of Acts, Luke tells us the story of Saul's conversion. As we already know, Saul had received papers signed by the chief priests in Jerusalem so that he could go to the synagogues in distant cities, arrest Christians, and bring them bound to Jerusalem to face trial. In verses 3 and 4 of Acts 9, we read, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Persecuting Christians has always been the same as persecuting Jesus Christ. John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 18, quotes Jesus saying, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. And in verse 20, he goes on to say, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The Apostle Paul later affirmed that persecution is the normal result of obedience to God. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now why have believers become such targets? Because Satan and his slaves can no longer personally attack the Son of God. Instead, Satan attacks Christ by assaulting the believers in Christ. He tries to destroy their testimony through temptations, destroy their confidence, replacing it with fear, or he lures them into complacency through dead religious practices so that they will be useless to God, ineffectual. And the Christians who allow themselves to become ineffectual 
will have to give account of themselves before Christ. But woe to those human agents who do the persecuting. The day will come when God will repay every evil deed and every evil word fired at his children. In Matthew 25, 32 to 46, Jesus talks about the judgment of the sheep and the goats. He's speaking metaphorically, of course, about people. And he says, Whatsoever ye have done to the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Saul was deserving of the harshest judgment, but Christ showed him mercy. We can hear that mercy flowing even in the way Jesus spoke to this enemy of the cross. Saul, Saul, he says, tenderly, repeating Saul's name in the same way he lovingly chided Martha of Bethany, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. In like manner, Jesus speaks to Saul of Tarsus, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus Christ is indeed abounding in mercy and love. What was that light that shone so brightly on the road to Damascus? What kind of light is able not only to make Saul fall to the ground, but according to Acts 26, 14, to make everyone that traveled with him fall to the ground? That light was the glorified Jesus Christ. It was the same light that enveloped Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. It is the same light that Satan wants to hide from all mankind today. You see, Satan has no problem with people acknowledging the existence of Jesus. Muslims acknowledged the existence of Jesus as being a prophet, lesser than Muhammad. The Buddhists acknowledge Jesus' existence, but Satan does not want anyone to recognize the glory of Christ the divine glory that is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, But if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Sometimes in the Greek language, it's hard to determine which words are describing others. The New American Standard Bible translates this verse a little differently. It reads, The light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. The glory of Christ is the gospel. It is Christ's glory that Paul had in mind when he wrote to the Corinthians. The Greek word for glory is describing Jesus Christ. Satan blinds unbelievers lest the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Saul experienced the glory of Christ and suddenly... And I like the word in this text. Suddenly there was no denying who Jesus is. For God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. This was Saul's moment of clarity, his moment of enlightenment, when the glory of Christ shone unto him. His whole life had been tied up in the study of scriptures, yet, like the other deceived religious leaders, he could not see that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah. But on that road... Christ was so glorious that Saul's intellectual and spiritual blindness could no longer be denied. God wanted him to know the depravity of his heart, so he made Saul blind to everything else. For three days, Saul was alone with himself in the darkness, in prayer and fasting. We also are blinded by sin and by Satan until God opens our hearts and minds to the glory of Jesus Christ. Our intellect and good deeds cannot lead us to salvation. Only God can reveal his truth to us and save us by his grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're going to take about a two-minute break now and have a special musical number sung by Pastor Herbert Hayes and his daughter Kim Galuba as they sing about the wonderful grace of God. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. 
grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's Let's get back now to that first conversation Saul had with Jesus Christ. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Acts 26, verse 14. What were the pricks Jesus mentioned here? It's really a stick or a goad with a sharp point on the end that is used to drive animals like oxen. But what specifically is Jesus referring to where Saul is concerned? Let me suggest four goads that Saul must have endured, and each sharp prick was meant to lead him to a close relationship with the risen Christ. But Saul resisted each goad until the wounds were a constant pain that made him more and more resentful. First, the stories of Jesus' miracles, character, and words would become increasingly known to Saul as Christians testified in their defenses. A second was the stoning of Stephen. His testimony and the peace with which he died would be a lifelong sorrow for the Apostle Paul. He would frequently refer to that incident to illustrate his own religious fervor and sinfulness. The third goad was the faith of the many Jewish Christians who endured Saul's persecutions. And the fourth goad is the most powerful of all, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 8, illustrates, As Jesus prepared to fulfill God's purpose on the cross of Calvary, he promised to send a comforter, the Holy Spirit. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Each of these testimonies must have pricked Saul's conscience, but his legalistic ideology demanded that he reject anything contrary to his beliefs. How many of us are the same way? We receive so many prods by the Holy Spirit to accept and receive God's gift. We have so many opportunities to be obedient to God, yet we decline. The question asked of Saul may be asked of us, Why persecutest thou me? Why do you reject me? Saul had a sudden and complete conversion. Who could ignore such an encounter? Read Luke's description of Saul's response. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Saul surrendered. But notice his first question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Old habits die hard. This is not the response of a man having faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is the response of a Pharisee. Saul had been trained to do things legalistically, but God doesn't give Saul rituals to carry out or great deeds to accomplish. He tells Saul to go into the city and wait until he is told what he must do. Saul's conversion was sincere, but it would take some time and maturing before he was ready to fulfill his preordained mission for Christ. For now, Saul had to learn what it was like to be blind and powerless and dependent on God's mercy. Saul learned his lesson well in these three days of blindness, as we see later in his ministry. But first, let's look at one more aspect of Saul's conversion that is often overlooked the healing by Ananias. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 18. 
Saul's reputation had preceded him. When God spoke to Ananias and told him to go find Saul, his response was what any reasoning person might ask. Are you sure about this, God? Don't you know who this man is and what he's been doing? Of course God knew. It's silly to ever doubt God's judgment. Only our understanding. God knew the plans he had for Saul, and he knew the price that would be paid for obedience. As he told Ananias, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias obeyed God's voice. He went to Saul, prayed for him, and Saul's sight was restored. It's very easy to overlook Ananias through this incident. Our concentration is focused on Saul, as it rightly should be. He brought the gospel to the Gentiles. He wrote many books of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is known and admired throughout the world. But Ananias was also a man of faith. How many of us would have been obedient to God in going to Saul, a known murderer of Christians? We never hear about Ananias except in relation to Saul's conversion. We don't know what other service he did for God. Would you be satisfied with that? Do you aspire to be an Apostle Paul or an Ananias? Both are worthy aspirations, but remember the costs if you want to be like Paul, knowing what great things he had to suffer. Perhaps that is not your calling. Maybe you're called to serve the Lord quietly, without glory or great accomplishments. That should be okay with us. God is sovereign. He knows what is best for us and the plans that he has for us. All we need is to be ready to obey when the Master calls. May God grant each of us the grace we need to serve him whenever, wherever, doing whatever he wants us to do. Thank you for joining me in this second lesson on the Apostle Paul. Great time right now if you have a Bible study leader to have a discussion over what we have just studied. And then join us again on the third lesson of the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul.